you, you, you can holler, you can applaud, you can scream, you can do anything you want. I can't hear you anyway. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for uh, responding. I was you're one of, of the first first people I thought of to be on the podcast because um, I just invo- enjoyed our conversation up at Slam Dance, and the film was was pretty incredible. So maybe I should just mention. So we're, we're with Steve Markle right here, and we met up at Slam Dance 2020. Uh, he was um, he had his film Shoot to Marry there, which had quite a bit of success. Um, I had to leave a little early, but it it won a big award, didn't it? It did. Well, it, it won uh, the audience award at Slam Dance, which was mind blowing. Um, so yeah, that was a really exciting pre COVID time. <laughs> that, I mean, I know I think back with such fond memories to anything pre COVID because it's so it's just a bizarre and. I don't know how, how it is up in Toronto. Um, how are you? Yeah. How are you holding up with all well, of those? Not to brag. We're doing, not that I have anything to do with it. We're doing <laughs> well as far as COVID goes in, in Toronto. I think uh, last I checked three or four days ago, we had one new case in a city of 4 million or oh so my, people. So that's oh pretty gosh. good. Wow. What's the, uh, what's the secret up there? I think we're kind of uh, going, we're going crazy down here in the states i yeah i know well that, of course the whole world is just watching the states we <laughs> no, nope, we're all in this together no, we can't open up until everyone's good yeah. so you know it, it's it's it doesn't really matter how well any one country is doing we need everybody to be in the clear before we can start traveling again and open everything up right I, yeah Absolutely. But we, we didn't know how lucky we were in January <laughs> at Sundance and Slam Dance. No. You know, because of course that was really the last major film festival before COVID. And then all the yeah. others just got shut down or turned into virtual festivals. Well, what's kind of crazy I, as I interviewed somebody up there, I'm not going to say who, but he was, he, he was, he was pretty sick when we talked and um, I don't know if he had it, but I, I had heard of a lot of people or enough people that I read an article, I think of the Hollywood Reporter about people um, that, you know, turns out they had it and they, you know, they, they drove back to LA and they just thought it was a really bad flu. Um, so I think it, and it's so weird because the year before I was up there and I was waiting for the, one of the bus uh, stops and it was late at night. And this guy turns to me and says, this is just, this is just a Petri dish waiting to explode. He's like, people from all over the world are coming here. It could be really bad. And I just kind of laughed at him. And that was a, just one year before all of this. So he was prophetic. It's so true. <laughs> it is so crowded on that main street. And everyone's in movie theaters and parties and bars. I, I think that I did have it from when I came back from from Park City to Toronto and about maybe 10 days later. So the timing works out. I, m- mild symptoms, but I had a very strange headache and I don't get headaches, uh-huh. but this was a sort of a strange feeling headache. And then a few days later, I woke up in the morning in a sweat, like a big pool of sweat in my oh bed. My goodness. So I thought, what the hell was that? <laughs> strange headache, sweating. I think I had it. I hope prob- I had it. Then I'm, <laughs> then I'm immune. You, you probably did. I mean, I had a, I had a cold. The last day I went up there, I had I was I had a cold coming on, and then I just it was just a cold, so I didn't think anything of it. I don't think I had it. I'm a bit I'm a bit nervous. I I'm a high school teacher, so mm-hmm. I go I go back with the kids. Great idea. I go back next Monday. Um, so that's a whole other story. I don't know. I don't want to get into that. But wish me luck. <laughs> so now, but what what is happening to you in in September? Are you sorry? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm back right now in a, in meetings, and then next week we have our students come in. So they've been, you know, we live in a very conservative state for the most part. I think in Park City you don't really see that element. Mm-hmm. Um, I love it here. I mean, I, I live here and I love it, but there are some things that just you know get get pushed through. 
Mm-hmm. And I don't know how it happens, but we're, we're going back. Kids have a, an option to distance learn, um, mm-hmm. but not a lot of them are doing it. We have 85, close to 90% of our students are coming back. Yeah. So we have to wear I mean, masks. I, under, I understand from the kids' perspectives, they want to, they, the social aspect of school oh. is the only fun part of it. I mean, it's been almost six months. They haven't, you know, if, if they didn't see their friends over the summer, um, yeah, I, I really feel for those kids. I mean, especially that, that last term was, uh, it just kind of, it just ended. It ended during, at the very end of third quarter, we just ended and it was like, yeah. Friday, see you Monday, we didn't come back. <laughs> yeah. So, and you know, fun. high school, these kids, if this is adolescence, these kids are going through puberty, their hormones are going crazy. Yeah. They want to, they want to pick up. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, I, and those seniors, like the kids graduating, uh, it, yeah. it was, it, all their prom got canceled. Um, graduation was like a drive through graduation. Yeah. And it was just, I think there was a lot of, they seem like they had good attitudes. Like I communicated with a lot of my seniors, you know, just over the, over our different classes. And a lot of them seem like they had really good attitudes. So uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know so, how well I would hand it, handle it mm-hmm. at that age. I don't think I would have handled it well. <laughs> yeah. The first high couple of weeks is awesome. High school and being a teenager, it's awkward enough. Ugh. I can't even <laughs> imagine throwing COVID into the mix. It's just the most awkward time. I think, uh, you know, when I was, I had bad acne in high school, so I think the mask would have been, would have helped me. I would have, mm-hmm. <laughs> they would have known. The I was in the same boat. I also had acne. And I, you know, this, I remember in high school, I didn't, I didn't have horrible acne, but I always had at least two or three zits that were constantly changing locations <laughs> on my face. It was like a practical joke. You know, one goes away, the other pops up. <laughs> I, I never didn't have a, at least one zit in those in that four year period. And I remember, and I am not a religious person, but I remember praying to the God that I don't believe in saying, God, (laughs) please, this is my one and only request. Enough with the acne, please, (laughs) you're killing me with the acne. And when my acne eventually did go away, the end of high school, it's ever since then, I, every now and then I, I am, I feel, I take time to feel thankful for not having it. I mean, you know, I'm 48 now. So this is 30 years later. I still, every now and then, you know, this is 30 years. I don't have acne. This is fantastic. It's great. Yeah. I mean, we can remember back to when that was, and it was, it was horrible being packed in with all those kids and you're just self-conscious and yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, maybe I bet, I bet a lot, some of these kids are on some level enjoying not having to be around their bullies and different people. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe some people, but I think but ultimately, they need, yeah, they need to be sad. beaten up the, by the bullies. That's <laughs> part of the experience. It's true. You, you need to develop as a person by being, you know, punished. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I and love it. Will, will you be wearing a mask then? Yeah, I got a mask. Yeah. I got a bunch of masks, so yeah. we'll we'll see. I think um, my guess is we'll we'll get shut down again, um, mm-hmm. but we'll see. Mm-hmm. We'll see how it it's goes. It's not going to be easy for you to teach in a mask and to project your voice and to be enthusiastic and. No, and I think the beard has to go because I I was wearing it today in the building. It's just all sweaty, and mm-hmm. I'm like, I I just I. I need every all the help I can get to get through this. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be a huge adjustment. Um, I'll let you know <laughs> how it <Yes>. goes. <laughs> good, good luck to you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, what was I going to ask you? Yeah. So when I, when I met you, um, I was it was Patricia Chica. Yes. That brought you up. So <clears throat> typically, when I interview someone, I've like read their book or seen their movie and you were the first person um because i was interviewing somebody else that she was representing and so she's like oh, i have a few more i'm gonna just bring them up and i'm like oh um i don't know I about remember, that I, was, I remember that you hadn't seen the movie i hadn't seen the but, movie so you're the first person that i've ever talked to where i hadn't actually seen 
yes. the work. So I always felt I felt guilty, but then you put me at ease right away, and you're like, "Oh no, it's great," and yes. you'll see it. And, here's and now you've about. seen it, and I loved it. And that's what's awkward if you don't like it. Um, <laughs> you know, you you want to promote it, but I loved it. And then I actually went back that that week and watched your other film, Camp Hollywood. Oh, that's Camp so Hollywood, nice. Right? Yeah, and I love that because yeah. we talked about that. Um, the I guess a mo is it a hotel motel where where you live yeah. down there in Los Angeles? Yeah, yeah. They call themselves a hotel, but that's a stretch. Yeah. I think motel is more fitting. You know, yeah. two story flea bag, sort yeah. of in a, a shitty apartment complex. But with uh, and if you haven't seen this movie, everybody, you need to go. It's on Amazon Prime still, I believe. Camp Hollywood, um, and Steve just. I don't know, maybe you could just briefly tell them about that. How, how did you like, I mean, there's some characters obviously in that. So was it pretty, pretty quick after moving in that you decided I'm going to, I need to make a documentary about this place and these people. Um, I mean, I have my favorite scene, I think is that my favorite scene in the whole movie is when that one guy who's trying to shoot his own movie in the courtyard right. there. And he's just so flamboyant and Marks yelling at everyone. And then he yells, he, he's, uh, he's upset with you. He's like, well, Steve is always filming in here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. He's trying to bring me down with him. <laughs> oh, my. Well, to answer your first question, I actually knew going down to L.A. that this was going to be one of my projects. I had visited a friend at that hotel, the Highland Gardens Hotel, uh, about six months earlier. I was there just for a couple of nights. And, and then my friend called and said, you know, I think there's, I don't know if it's a, a scripted series or a movie or a documentary or there's something at this hotel. And I, I it immediately said, you know, a hundred percent. I felt it the two nights I was there. There is something magical about that place. All of those characters, this eclectic mix of, you know, young wannabe stars mostly actors but also musicians and and stand-up comics and then these older folks who would sort of retired to the hotel and were sort of at the end of their careers if they had any career and the mix of the the young hopeful types and the older washed out hollywood types it was beautiful so i went to, and i'd always wanted to live in LA and try stand-up comedy myself. And so I spent a few years um, living at this hotel, the Highland Guards, um, while I was trying stand-up. And at the same time, filming this documentary that would become Camp Hollywood. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely, yeah, I, I, lo I mean, I love, when you told, I knew exactly where that place was. So when you told me about it, I'm like, I have to see this. And then I'd, I'd seen Shoot to Mary um, up there at Slam Dance at the first screening and, and loved it. Um, well, just before I forget, like where, that is available now for people to see, right? Shoot to Mary? Yes. Okay, Shoot where can we Mary see that? Out, well, Shoot to Mary is also on Amazon Prime. Uh -oh. uh, and you can find it on, on iTunes and um all of the major vod platforms great that's that's yeah. that's cool okay yeah um yeah, a pause there i'm gonna do two things my yes. dog desperately wants to come in bring him, bring him in and also a loud <laughs> air conditioning just turned on so oh. i'm turn it off for the <laughs> sake of our audio go for it yeah okay the hey, ac so will if i don't know if you can hear but it will shut off in about i don't I don't even and hear so, it. Yeah, okay. I don't. I don't hear it. Um, I thought that was my dog. If I have three dogs upstairs, <laughs> so I heard I, yours. Did you? Yeah. So I heard maybe. your dogs. My, well, my dog was. It was a quiet sound, but it was driving me crazy. Okay. I closed the door, and he he was on the other side of there, scratching at the door. <laughs> if you wanted to come in. Okay. So where that was my dog? In, he's settled. I can see him. He's yeah. I love. I love yeah. it. <laughs> he's happy now. <laughs> well, he's yeah. He's good. Yeah. Uh, so what are are you um what, are you working on anything right now or is it just kind of everything's on timeout on pause that's that's how i feel uh well yeah i mean when when back at the early stages of covid like march april i was so wrapped up 
in the anxiety of the whole thing, I, I was unable to do anything other than panic. <laughs> you know, yeah. we just beginning, we didn't really know what this thing was. I'm thinking, you know, is this it? Are we all going to die? Is this the end? And so it was a few months of that, just, you know, obsessing over the news, which that didn't help because mm. the media with their, all the hyperbole and the exaggeration and the wild predictions, that was not good for me. Um, but I, you know, a turning point for me was just about a month ago, my brother had rented a cottage outside of Toronto in Northern Ontario. And he says, come for a night, come to the cottage. I'm not a cottage outdoorsy person at all. <laughs> but I thought, okay, being inside and reading the New York Times is not helping. So I did, I went, I ended up going for three nights and it was amazing. It was like the lake just ate my anxiety and it was a reminder to me of what is important in the world and it's, it's our relationships and being with family and being outdoors and just the simple things. And uh, since then, I've been great. And, um, and yes, been, now I am thinking about, you know, next projects, uh, yeah. though I'm not sure I found it yet, but um, I do that thing where, you know, I'll have a brilliant idea, usually as I'm drifting off to sleep and I'll jot it down. I think, oh my God, this is it. This is the next talk. And then I, I look at the idea the next morning and it's just garbage. Yeah. So it's think, a lot of that. Yeah, that, that, no, I have the same. I'm writing a book right now. That's the same, the same thing. I'll wake up in the middle of the night and jot something down and I can't even, yeah. I can't read it the next morning. So it's like right. probably a bad idea, but I can't even, I'm, it's not even legible. Right. That, that's so interesting. Cause I, we went up to uh, just about a month ago, exact same thing. And I think a lot of people can probably relate to how you're feeling, but I was like, I got, I got to get out of town. So we went up to uh, Laramie, Wyoming which is a pretty uh, rural, isolated place and just got an Airbnb outside of the town and no cell phone reception, no internet, but it was a nice house. And it was just, they had, they had 30 acres. We didn't even know that going into it. We just, got a, we just got this house and they're like, oh yeah, it's 30 acres. There's no one around you. And it was, it was outstanding. It was the best thing. And I think just being away, I'm like, for all I know, the world could have blown up, you know, everywhere else. But we were good and mm -hmm. <laughs> it helped. Yeah. It helps tremendously just two or three days. It's so true. And, and, and being with the people you love. Absolutely. What else yeah. is there? Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and also since I've been back, I've made a point to really disconnect from the news, from social media. Um, I mean, I'm not saying I don't, I look a little bit, I want to be somewhat informed, but um, it can become a, hab a habit obsessing over this stuff and also and there's so much noise in the news and social media and most of it's noise because oh, yeah. really we still don't know exactly what covid is and so uh yeah i'm trying to turn off all that stuff and just um yeah just enjoy my my people my small circle of people who i love and um you know yeah, li listening to a lot of um, meditation stuff. You know, I've gotten into Tara Brock. I don't know if you know who she is. She's got a podcast on meditation, which I've been into. So, yeah. Nice. No, good advice for us all. I mean, I think, yeah, I just, I had a hard time focusing on anything. And I feel like I'm just kind of coming out of that now. Couldn't read. Um, but I think that's it. Yeah, I'm just scrolling, looking at, shit <laughs> and, and 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 it's like changing day to day which is understandable because we don't know this thing mm -hmm. but then um and then the anti-maskers that mm -hmm. we have here there was like they're doing flash mobs in local grocery stores people running in without masks and like coughing on other people no <laughs> yes <laughs> that is insane i i had a run-in with an anti-masker yeah Would you like to, yeah oh, I, let's hear it yeah well Okay, so this is about two weeks ago. I went to a, um, a, a small grocery store in, in Toronto called The Cheese Boutique. And um, I, I go in and just behind me, coming in after me, four people, I would say in their, in their 50s, two couples, 
no masks. And I turned to one of them, the person who was closest to me, a woman. I said, oh, you, you forgot your mask. <laughs> and he said, I, I have a medical condition. I said, oh, well, if you have a medical condition, even more reason to put a mask on. <laughs> what about your three friends? What's their excuse? And she said, oh, they also have medical conditions. I said, was that right? The four of you. Well, you know, did you bring a note from your, from your doctor? <laughs> no, no, we don't have a note from our doctor. I said, all right, well, I'll tell you what, you've got two choices. You put masks on or you leave because it's not fair. And there's, I pointed, there was a woman behind her, an older woman, an 80 year old woman shopping. And she had her mask on. I said, this lady is wearing a mask as a courtesy to you. And you're not showing her the same courtesy. So mask on or out. <laughs> uh, and she says, and then she started going on about, freedom it was speech about freedom i said lady this isn't a conversation you put a mask on or you and now the staff are starting to kind of circle because they see there's a bit of a scene and the the four of these anti-maskers they've spread out at this point they're shopping one of them is at the cheese counter and i call out to the employee the young kid behind the, the cheese counter i said don't sell cheese to that man <laughs> don't sell these people anything and now things start to escalate and the this is an italian run grocer store, and the matriarch comes out this big italian woman and she starts screaming i'm talking 10 out of 10 screaming get out <laughs> and then not even words just ah <laughs> screaming and then, and then her son comes out. The Italian son is about like 40 and muscular, this beefy guy. And he threatens one of the anti-maskers. He says to this guy, you know, either you leave now or I'm going to carry you out. And then he <laughs> makes good on that threat because they were not leaving. <laughs> and this Italian guy lifts up one of the anti-maskers. He's got him from behind like a rag doll. That, this anti-masker is waving his arms and his legs are, and now, and I don't know if it was intentional or an accident, but with his legs, he's like knocking jars of olives and like, this is a nice store, by the way. This is like, you know, even more expensive than Whole Foods. It's like this boutique where they sell really fine stuff. And so he's knocking really good pasta sauces and and like high-end jarred goods, and there's broken glass everywhere. People are now filming on their iPhones. I'm officially, <laughs> I feel like I'm in a YouTube video. And, and it's exciting, I'll be honest. Because, you know, after being cooped up for three or four months, this is exactly the sort of excitement I need. And now one of the anti-maskers says, I'm, I'm calling the police. And now and the staff, they're like, we're calling the police. And it's like a race, who can which side can call the police first and two cops show up and one cop takes these four anti-maskers outside and gets their story out on the curb and the other cop is inside the cheese boutique and taking this this one guy's story who had been you know manhandled and i was worried that this italian guy the owner that he was going to get in trouble because you know Technically, you're not really supposed to like start getting physical with somebody. And so I says to the cop, I says, listen, I'm a customer here. I want you to know the staff, the employees, they handled themselves perfectly. They were, you know, they, this guy only used just enough force to try to get these people out of the store safely to protect this, the customer. So now the cop wants my story. He says, oh, good. I, I'd rather get your story, you know, than from the owners because you're impartial. And so he takes my name and my contacts and I give him the whole story and tell them that the staff were awesome. And things start to settle down. And eventually I, I get to my shopping. And like I said, this is like a high end kind of like, I don't do my everyday shopping there, but I, I had some people coming over for like a backyard visit. Mm -hmm. So if I've got people coming over, I'll go to the cheese boutique to get some nice cheeses, you know what I'm saying? And so I, 20 minutes throwing things into my 
cart and then I'm checking out and then the woman bags all my stuff and I take my credit card and I go to put it in the credit card reader and she puts her hand in front of the reader to block my card. She says, boss says you don't pay. <laughs> boss says you don't pay. It was thrilling. But instantly I regretted all of the goods that I had decided not to put in my cart because they were too expensive. <laughs> there were like at least 10 items I was debating. Well, I, these crackers look really nice, but you know, $10 for a box of crackers. So many things I decided not to put in my cart. And I wish I could go back and put them back in the cart. But what a thrill <laughs> it was to go head to head with the anti-maskers. I love it. Maybe that could be your next film. You could go around to diff different boutique stores mm -hmm. and, and wait for those people to come in. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> wait for them. That's good. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's incredible. That's I love that you inserted yourself into that situation because I think I would have just tried to glare, you know, through my mask and, and yeah. the opposite direction. So I love that you, you did something about you it. You know, I'm not a fighter generally. I'm a, I'm a meek, quiet guy. But every now and then, and I don't know what it is, maybe some pent up anger or something, <laughs> but every now and then I get in a fighting mood. So it was kind of good. I felt like, three, four months of just pretty much being at home all the time. And I was ready for a fight. <laughs> and, and clearly these anti-maskers, they also wanted a fight. I mean, you know what I mean? They go in, I think, looking for a fight. I think so. They, they, they know what's happening in the world. They know that stores are requiring masks. They yeah. know that. And they go in and they're, they're waiting for someone to confront them. They want, they want it. <laughs> I think so. And, and so I guess it was a win-win. They were looking for a fight. I was looking for a fight. <laughs> Everyone won. And I got free groceries out of the deal. It was a good day. That's amazing. I love don't sell cheese to that man. That's, that's my new line. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you have a chance to use that one. I wanna, I'm going to say that. Whether it makes sense or not. I'd love to hear that one just completely out of context. No sense whatsoever. Don't sell cheese to that man. Uh, that's the best. Um, are, you, uh, are you reading anything these days? I mean, like I said, I haven't been able to read up until recently, so I don't know how much of a reader you are, but I'm kind of well, curious what you've been. I, 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 like, I don't read novels. I've never been able to get into uh, into fiction. I get frick for for my fiction fix. I go to the movies and, and television, but for when I read, it's generally uh, memoirs and other nonfiction stuff. So I, I recently read um, Woody Allen's autobiography. I just I just it. read that too. I read that too. I loved it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so good. But interestingly, you know, some of the people who reviewed Shoot to Mary made comparisons to Woody Allen, which I take as a great compliment, but those, those critics then gave the movie bad ratings. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's almost like they're not allowed to like Woody anymore. Or like to say that someone is like Woody Allen, that used <laughs> to be for a filmmaker for many decades, the greatest compliment you could get. Now it's not, it's not so great. Um, I also read uh, about a month ago, this is an older title, but Barry Sonnenfeld's book. Um, I'm not a fan necessarily of his films that he's directed, like Men in Black's not really my thing, but he was the cinematographer on many, many amazing films. Films by the Coen brothers, Raising Arizona and stuff like that. I didn't know that, oh wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's his background, is as a as a DP, and then at a certain point he got the chance to start directing. Um, but his book is great. You can see I, I have a, you know, with, I, I just go from one neurotic Jew to another. <laughs> this is what a great range I have in my what I read. <laughs> oh boy, I'm trying to see. Oh, you might hold on a second. You might like this. So I was like, this is pretty good. Um, 
this is a it's a graphic novel, but it's a biography mm-hmm. of a uh, Schlitzie, mm-hmm. the, the pinhead from a. Uh, do you know that that film from the '30s, Freaks? Um, you you should look it up after if okay. you haven't seen it before. It's it's pretty interesting. So this guy was like a sideshow person. So mm-hmm. um, interesting, but it's like a really cool. So I started getting into graphic novels, which I'd never done before because I mm-hmm. was having a hard time focusing. Mm-hmm. And this is an incredible book. I don't know. I ended up talking okay. to the guy. I'll write it down. Yeah, it's called Nobody's Fool. This one, but uh, Schlitzy, the Pinhead. It's interesting. But that's, you know, that's showbiz. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's as close to a biography because there's not a lot of information on, mm-hmm. on him. So um, pretty interesting mm-hmm. stuff. That's what I like to read. I love reading memoirs, especially by artists. Uh, a few months ago, I read, uh, it, well, it wasn't a memoir. It was uh, about Mike Nichols, the director. And he didn't want to write a memoir, but... Um, someone pieced together a book, which is a collection of interviews about Mike Nichols. Okay. And so you, they sort of tell the story of his life and his career through all of these interviews. And I really enjoyed that book. Um, yeah, I just, I love, I can't get enough of that. I love reading about um, the artists that I mm-hmm. love, filmmakers and musicians and comics. Um, you know, I, I, some of my favorite books. I loved Steve Martin's book, Born Standing yeah, Up. Yeah, that, that was great. That was great. Incredible. Yeah. Sarah Silverman's book, Bedwetter, I thought was I haven't excellent. read that. I'll have to check that out. Um, you might like a book called, I think it's just called The Comedians, and it's by a, an author. I think his name is Cliff. Um, oh, I forget his last name. It's Cliff, but it's like K-L-I-P-H. Um, and it kind of covers like the history of American comedy mm-hmm. from vaudeville up until now. Mm-hmm. And which is kind of, a, it's pretty ambitious to, to try to cover all of that, but mm-hmm. he does, he does a really, really good job in it. You know, mm-hmm. all the old radio guys and, uh, early TV and, uh, like George Carlin and all those seventies mm-hmm. comics. So, mm-hmm. uh, you might want to check that one out. Okay. And see where, I wrote that down too. Yeah. Thank you. Um, How about shows? How about uh, any good movies? Or shows. I, haven't, I haven't had a good uh, I haven't had a good movie in a long time, but there's some good series that I've been mm-hmm. pick, picking through. What about you? Oh, I mean, there's it's endless. Yeah, there's so there's Too so much. much content, and I have a list. I keep a list of you know recommendations that I get from people, and I actually I, I, I so many things to get to, but um, what was some of the great stuff I've seen? Well, I, I just finished yesterday watching, um, there's a three-part Amy Schumer docuseries that she filmed while she was pregnant. Okay, I've heard of that, yeah, I've and heard of it, okay. It's called Expecting Amy, and I loved it. It's, she, she's pregnant, and it was a very difficult pregnancy. She was very, very sick, but at the same time, while she is vomiting every day, she's performing mm-hmm. and, and building material for, for a Netflix special. Oh, she's, and going, she's going out and performing. She's performing in, in small clubs and also in theaters. Wow. And, you know, she's going out on stage with a vomit bucket just in case i mean that's how sick she was and she wasn't putting it on it wasn't just for show she was truly uh really really sick and it was so impressive um to see oh her, her work ethic her passion for comedy that she was working through those rough months um and then it's lovely to see you know get a glimpse into her private life and a relationship with her husband who seems like a great guy um they discover along the way that he is on the uh autism scale he's got oh, mild wow. asperger's yeah uh-huh. wow and um <clears throat> and she says you know that would explain all the reasons that she loves him because she loves <laughs> his his honesty the fact that he's unfiltered yeah and that is a quality of someone with asperger's so 
uh, yeah. That sounds right. yeah. I gotta check that. Series. I gotta check that out. What is it on? Uh, HBO. HBO. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Um, I need I need some good comedy because I've been I've been watching too many heavy, heavy mm -hmm. things. I watched um, and I keep saying this with these other interviews I've been doing. I having a hard time focusing, so I started watching a lot of um of those international or foreign series on Netflix. And there, there's a ton of them and some are incredible. Like there is mm -hmm. a, there's one called Fauda out of Israel, mm. pretty, pretty intense show. Um, and then there was one called, I heard Ca that was great. It was good. And then there was a limited series called Caliphate that mm. I can't say enough about that's um, out of Sweden, mm -hmm. I think. So I love it, but I, I kind of need a break from some heavy, Mm -hmm. stuff. I need some. I need some comedy with some mm -hmm. with some heart. Mm -hmm. So, I gotta um, think into that. Yeah, I was also watching some wild international stuff on on Mubi. You know that service, Mubi. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Um, so sometimes I'll just watch just random stuff. Watch this Greek movie about a a, a psycho man. Uh, who traps his brings his kids up uh, in in a in a um, fenced in home in the middle of nowhere in some rural area. So the kids have no sense. They grew up no sense of the outside world, and he feeds them all of this false information about the outside world to scare scare them into le wanting to leap so he keeps his kids trapped in this house and then it, and it becomes a story of, of incest and it's extremely disturbing <laughs> that's not, <laughs> that's not, yeah it's, it's not funny but i'm like yeah. that does sound extremely disturbing it's disturbing <laughs> but uh amazing to it's fun to watch stuff coming out of other countries you know because they'd always has such a different sensibility the pacing is is often much slower than we're used to yeah well that's one of the things and i'm so happy that a lot of the stuff is becoming more accessible. you know accessible yeah on netflix and stuff because that was one of my favorite things it still is going up to film festivals as you mm -hmm. see all these films from different countries mm -hmm. that you wouldn't normally see and they it yeah. is it is true because i think with uh you know a lot of western cinema and, and series mm -hmm. Our brain, like we are so savvy as viewers, we anticipate, like, like we're storytellers because we watch so much stuff, and yeah. you you kind of have a feeling when something's gonna go wrong mm -hmm. or right, um, and I think with a lot of those films, because it is different, there's a you know, they have different culture, whatever it is, it surprise it surprises me more when I see mm -hmm. some of the ways they take it. So it's like, I have no idea what's going to happen next. And I love mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. And also there's so many classic movies that I, I just haven't seen. Like for example, a movie, I just watched blow up the Antonioni movie. Italian. Yeah. Uh -huh. so I'd never seen it and loved it. It was just so I need stylish. To, I need to get, I need to get movie. Yeah. I hadn't, mm -hmm. I hadn't thought to even get that. I didn't know there was, all those kinds of things on there yeah that's great um i've been watching i got criterion channel through mm -hmm. all through all this so mm -hmm. i don't even know where to start there's too much in there i was watching yeah. a john castavetti's film last night but i i liked it but i fell asleep in the middle mm -hmm. of it but, um mm -hmm. so yeah there, there's just too much you're right like i have a list as well yeah. and uh if you, you i don't know about you but i get like stressed out <laughs> yeah. this is this should be entertainment and it's like right. stressful it's like i have all this stuff i gotta get through <laughs> yeah well it's when not... covid first hit back when i was really gripped by the stress of the whole thing i found it comforting to watch familiar movies from my childhood so like you know i rewatched greece yeah I love and i needed that i needed to i needed to pick me up and the music is so damn good. It is, yeah. It never stops <laughs> being good. And I rewatched Carrie, you know, which is I such seen a great that. movie. I hadn't yeah. seen it since I was a kid. And, Same here, yeah. Um, rewatched uh, Fatal Attraction. 
which is so damn good. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah. caught something that I didn't the first time around, which is, uh, you've seen Fail Attraction? Yeah, a long, long time ago. It's been a long time. Oh, well, there's a great line and it goes really quick. And so you wouldn't pick up on it the, the, uh, after, during a first view. But so uh, the first weekend that they hook up, Michael Douglas and um, uh, what's the actress's name? Uh, Glenn Close, mm, mm -hmm. and uh, they they hook up in her in her loft in like the meatpacking district in New York, and they and it's sexy, and they have sex, and it's exciting, and then the next morning, he he goes home, he goes you know he's, he's a married man, so he goes back to his apartment, and then the phone rings, and it's the first of many times that Glenn Close would call unexpectedly, phone rings, he picks up. She says, uh, I woke up and you weren't here. I hate that. He said, oh, I, I, left you, I left you a note. You didn't see the note? And then she sees the note and she reads it. She says, oh, that's, that's sweet, but, um, but come back. I want, you know, I'll, ma I'll make you breakfast. And he says, oh, you know, uh, I've, I've got so much work to do. It was so fun last night, but, you know, I should really just, you know, I've got to get my, my work done and my, the dogs. I haven't walked the dogs. And she says, uh, you know, bring the dogs. I, I, I love animals. I'm a great cook. And it just goes, <laughs> goes by very quickly, you know, love animals. I'm a good <laughs> cook. But of course that famous scene an hour later into the movie, yeah. boils his daughter's rabbit. <laughs> and it's just a great payoff. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. yeah I didn't catch that either. I, yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah. I, I should rewatch stuff when we were up in Laramie. Um, they had t they had TV there, and they had um, I don't know if it was like Nick at Nick at Night or whatever, but it was uh, a lot of the old like fifties and sixties series. So at night we would just watch a couple like like a Leave It to Beaver mm. and that My Three Sons, and it was so <laughs> relaxing. I mean those yeah. shows are so cheesy, but they yeah. they drew me in, and you know it was just kind of wholesome, and mm -hmm. it, it was nice. It felt good. Yeah. I never watched My Three Sons, but Leave It to Beaver, I think every day I watched Leave It to Beaver. It yeah. Was, the reruns were on, uh, I don't know what channel, but you'd grow. if I had a, a sick day too during elementary school, if there was a day when I was homesick, you know, I'd watch like The Price is Right, The Flintstones, and Leave It to Beaver. Yeah. Yeah, there's something comforting about those, those shows yeah. that you see. Even though, even yeah, we you know they were way before our time, but yeah. re reruns were always playing. Yeah, so I grew up on a lot of those shows too. Yeah, Mash <laughs> reruns. Oh, I, I love, love Mash. Mash. Yeah. Obsessed Mash is over great. that show. Yeah, that's a good one. And then I I had a the chance to meet Alan. All it was one of the few times in my life when I've met a star that who I really looked up to mm -hmm. and was disappointed. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, I would. This is. 20 years ago, I was in my 20s, and I was on a trip with my girlfriend at that time to New York, and we were there for a couple of nights, and we went to see a play called Art. We went to see it because Alan Alda was in it, and I was mm -hmm. just a huge MASH fan, and I thought, oh, we got to go see, I want to see Alan Alda on stage, and then maybe, maybe I will have a chance to meet him after the show. And so we saw the show. And then we found the backstage door afterwards. It was sort of like in an alley. And, you know, some shows on Broadway, when there's a famous person in the show, they get crowds waiting to meet the person after. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Alan Alda at that stage in his group was not a celebrity. It's years after MASH had ended. So I was the only person who was <laughs> with my girlfriend, although she wasn't interested in Alan Alda. She was just there to support me and, the only person at the backstage door said that this is great. He'll be delighted that he has a fan <laughs> and waited about 30. And this is before long before iPhones, we had a dis disposable camera, one of those little box cameras. And I uh -huh. wanted my girlfriend to take a picture of me with that one. All. And the door swung open and there was Hawkeye. <laughs> and I, I, you know, sort of idolized Hawkeye. Like, to me, that character, he was sort of who I wanted to be when I grew up. 
like he was sort of in my mind this perfect guy because he was charming and he was a ladies man but he was also like a great surgeon and a brilliant guy and sensitive he was just sort of the seemed to me like the perfect guy so the door swings open this back out and there's hawkeye and he's a tall guy alan alders didn't realize how tall he was tall and handsome and i was nervous and excited and i said oh hello mr alda thank you we enjoyed the play and may i please have a picture with you and he said no (laughs) <laughs> and he kept walking and he disappeared into another backstage door that connected with the theater that where the phantom of the opera was playing and i thought what like he didn't say i, I don't really you know, i don't really love getting my picture take or some explanation or it was just no and gone and i was so <laughs> crushed oh. and then about 10 minutes later it, one of the actors from the Phantom of the Opera came out. It was there. It was uh, the end of their show, I guess, or maybe it was their intermission or something. And this guy came out. And he, he was. Uh, he he had the Phantom mask. Actually, he was in the back alley. He was there for a smoke or something during their intermission. He wasn't. <laughs> he wasn't playing the Phantom, but he explained that there's a scene in the Phantom of the Opera where like. The Phantom is everywhere and the theater is there and he's there. So he's a sort of a double for the Phantom in one of these scenes. And that's why he had the mask. Anyway, I told him, I told, I told this, the Phantom now, I'm talking to the Phantom, one of them, the Phantom's <laughs> double, explaining that I just got crushed by Alan Alda. And then he said no and disappeared into, into the Phantom Theater. And he said, oh yeah, yeah, that's how Alan Alda leaves. He wants to like avoid the New York crowd. So he has the strange route through the backs of other theaters that he uses to escape. And then sort of, I was felt very dejected by Hawkeye. And I walk out to the main street and some other fans were there. And they said, did you just try to meet Alan Alda? And I said, yeah. And they said, was he kind of rude to you? I said, yeah, yeah. They said, well, we tried to meet him last night and he was rude to us. So, it made me feel a little bit better knowing, okay, I shouldn't take it personally, but I was a little disappointed in Hawkeye. Yeah, you, you don't meet your heroes. It, you know, it's too yeah. risky. It's too risky. <laughs> yeah, maybe it is. I've met other heroes and th- who haven't disappointed. I've met a lot of, but anyways, you're right. That is a risk. They might disappoint. And I tried to, in my mind, make excuses for Alan Alda, like, oh, maybe there's something going on in his private life I don't, wouldn't know about. He's in a bad mood. He's having a bad week. There's a family tragedy. There's this, there's that. But then I thought, you know, if, if I were in his shoes, if I was a famous person and I was going through something rough in my personal life, but there was a fan that really wanted to have their 10 seconds with me and say, hello, I'd put on a smile and of course I'll take your picture. So I couldn't really yeah. find an excuse for Alan Alda. <laughs> but I still love Hawkeye. Hawkeye's the best, yeah. I, have to, yeah. I, can, <laughs> I can separate the two and say, <laughs> shame on you, Alan Alda, but I still love you, Hawkeye. I love it. That is a perfect spot to wrap up <laughs> this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, well, yeah, anything else you want to say? I mean, definitely check out Steve Markle's two films on Amazon Prime. We have Camp Hollywood, and the most recent one is uh, Shoot to Mary, which was incredible. Um, Woody Allen comparisons, but don't um, <laughs> don't, don't, don't have on. that in your mind. Yeah, don't hang, that, <laughs> hang on to that when you watch. But yeah. It's a great film. I loved it. It was such a... Um, pleasure talking to you again it was yeah this is it it reminds me of like you said pre-covid times and yes it's nice to see a face you don't see a lot of faces these days that's true (laughs) we have we have faces this is this is what this is my takeaway from this conversation kyler is that you and i both have faces (laughs) that's that's uh, that's deep i like that Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, great. Um, thank you so much. And um, Thank you, Kyler. This was fun. Yeah. 
And if I can leave you with one thing, one thought, one, one bit of wisdom, and this is for you, this is for anyone listening, it is this. Don't serve cheese to that man. <laughs> <laughs>